Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sean Devereaux. I am the Director of Volunteer Engagement at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and it is my pleasure to be your host tonight for this evening's lecture. Before we begin, I would like to first thank our lecture sponsors, the Gazette Newspapers and Courtyard Marriott. Thank you very much for your support of this series. I am honored to introduce tonight's speakers who are all representatives from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums Florida Reef Tract Rescue Project. They will be telling a tale about rescuing corals from a deadly disease in Florida. This story is set against the backdrop of exotic places with a cunning villain, colorful characters, and valiant heroes that all play a role. Before we begin, let's meet our speakers today. Beth Virchow is a longtime conservation advocate, having served for 30 years in public aquariums and zoos in animal care, management, and conservation. Currently, she leads the Florida Reef Track Rescue Project for the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Maurizio Martinelli is a formal National Coral Reef Management Fellow with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Today, he serves as Florida Sea Grant's Coral Disease Response Coordinator. Michelle Gralty is a graduate of Miami University's Rose Steele School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Currently, she serves as the Coral Reef Conservation Program Awareness and Appreciation Project Coordinator for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Chris Corpus is a familiar face here at the Aquarium of the Pacific as the formal audiovisual production manager. He now serves as conservation programs manager for the Dallas Zoo, and he began his work on AZA's Florida Reef Tract Rescue Group messaging team under the guidance of the aquarium's past president, Dr. Jerry Schubel. Now I'll turn it over to our speakers to see how this tale unfolds. Thanks, Sean. Thanks so much for that great introduction. We are really excited to be here today to share this adventure. And let me preface this story today by saying that for myself and the colleagues that are with us today and the colleagues that we're representing, conservation is probably the top reason why we got into the careers that we have. Conservation efforts are compelling, they're exciting. Conservation efforts allow us to give back to nature, especially now when we're taking so much from her. So when a conservation project, a rescue project comes along that rivals any great adventure story, is it any wonder that we didn't ask what seat we were going to have, but we asked how soon do we board? So today, I hope everybody fastens their seat belts for a fantastic adventure and a story about bringing hope to Florida corals. Our story is set in the Florida Reef Tract or the Florida's Coral Reef. This bank reef, similar to a barrier reef, extends a little over 300 linear miles from just north of Port St. Lucie on the southeast coast of Florida through the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, the Marquesas Islands, and to the Dry Tortugas National Park. To put it in perspective, the size of this reef system, if you, if you stretched it end to end, it would, it would extend from Los Angeles to Tijuana, Mexico, Seattle to Vancouver, Columbus, Ohio to Indianapolis, Indiana. It is as long as Long Island. It is the largest coral reef in the continental United States, and as such, it's an environmental powerhouse, providing homes and breeding places and hunting spaces for thousands of marine species and coastal protection to the southeast coast of Florida. It's an economic powerhouse as well, generating over $8 billion in revenue for the state of Florida and 70,000 jobs a year. And if you've ever listened to a Jimmy Buffett song, you know that it's also a cultural powerhouse. Similar to Yellowstone, the Great Lakes, the Grand Canyon, the Rocky Mountains, or the Everglades. It is unique and its scale is immense and it's a national treasure. Now, at the Reefs Foundation are our list of characters to this story. The reef building corals. Corals like maize corals, brain corals, cactus corals, and star corals are the reef, builds, reef builders of the Florida Reef Track. 
Some of these corals get to be the size of a Volkswagen and live hundreds and hundreds of years. There are 45 species of reef building corals that call our coral reef community home. This community has been in existence for millions of years, growing and building what we see today, managing as best as it can the ocean's changing environment, like all coral reefs all over the world. But recently, one bad ombre has come to the Florida's coast. This villain strikes quickly and with deadly efficiency, targeting 22 of our 45 reef building characters, some of which are endangered species listed corals. They are the main target of this disease. So cue the ominous music to meet our villain, stony coral tissue loss disease. All right, thanks very much, Beth. Um, I think as Beth mentioned, every good adventure story needs a villain. And with coral reefs, especially coral reefs in Florida, it can be really difficult to identify a single villain. Our coral reefs, not just in Florida, but across the globe, um, are threatened by some global insults, chief among them global warming and ocean acidification. Um, these are both byproducts of all of the greenhouse gases that we're emitting out into the atmosphere. Um, global warming, what things like carbon dioxide and methane do is they, they trap heat that's coming from the sun um, within our atmosphere and it's slowly heating up our planet, including our oceans. I think some of the really visceral examples of how bad this is are from the poles, like Antarctica, where you see the melting ice and the polar bears losing um, their home. But as it turns out, it's an issue for our tropical oceans as well, um, where it's just getting a little bit too hot for a lot of the creatures there, including our corals. Ocean acidification is a byproduct of primarily carbon dioxide that we're emitting out into the atmosphere, getting drawn down into the ocean and following some you know, chemical processes are slowly acidifying the ocean. And that makes it really difficult for all of the animals that live in the ocean that do things like build and maintain shells or skeletons. And once again, corals are one of these animals. They build a skeleton under a thin veneer of tissue and those are, those are really, really important to building those reefs as Beth was mentioning. However, these are not the only insults that are being faced by our coral reefs. They're also a series of local insults um, that are particularly pronounced in Florida. Um, these are primarily driven by just how many people we have directly adjacent or accessing our reefs. So we've got about 7 million people that live permanently right next to these coral reefs and an additional 38 million that visit every single year. And so that's the equivalent of about the entire population of California coming to visit Florida. Um, and there's lots of associated insults that come with that and that includes um, you know, the pollution that we're adding there, be it from wastewater or just land, uh, runoff from land. It's overfishing. It's us directly trampling the reefs or running our boats into it. And so it is really just one thing after their next. And corals, like many animals, they can perhaps deal with one insult, maybe two simultaneously. But what we're really seeing is that we're piling on insult after insult, and it's almost like a death by a thousand cuts. So for us scientists, we end up seeing a lot of graphs that look like this. Now the specifics don't matter that much, but pretty much what you're seeing is along that y-axis, that vertical up and down axis, is a metric like uh, coral cover, which is essentially saying how much of this reef area is covered by these really important corals. Along that x-axis or the horizontal bottom axis, you have your time, and here they're all by year. And so what we're seeing across all of these different um, studies is that through time, now for decades, we've seen this pretty steady decline in coral throughout Florida. For those who maybe want a little bit better of a picture, this is what it can look like. And I apologize, these are actually Pacific corals, but I think this really illustrates how you can go from a very vibrant, colorful, productive reef um, to one that looks a little bit more monotone like you're seeing all the, on the right. What you're seeing there is dead coral that has been colonized. Their skeletons, remember, are being colonized by a turf algae that just does not present, provide the same kind of habitat or reef building um, possibilities that a live coral does. And so when we have all of these things piling up on top of each other, we have the loss of all these corals, the loss of that habitat, um, and the loss of things like coastal protections that our coral reefs provide. And so the latest in this litany of insults is stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, this is a novel disease. It came out around uh, 2014 off the coast of Miami-Dade County, and it's something that we here in Florida have been experiencing ever since then. 
And so what I'm going to paint for you now is why we really care about this insult and why this might be the final insult for a number of the coral species that we have here in Florida. But in order to understand what this is, I kind of want to start first with uh, what, is, what is a healthy coral compared to a bleached coral compared to this tissue loss disease. Uh, so a colleague recently explained a coral as pretty much an upside down jellyfish that has a bunch of um, algae living inside its tissue that sits within a cup that cup being that skeleton that I had mentioned. And so when you have a healthy coral, like what's seen all the way on the left, is you have that intact skeleton, the coral animal is happy, and that yellow that you see inside of it is a symbiotic algae um, that's photosynthesizing and providing the coral with a lot of its energy. So you can think about that like if you had some leaves underneath your skin and you could sit outside all day and you'd only need to eat, say, a tenth of what you would normally eat because those leaves are photosynthesizing for you. That's what the coral enjoys with its algae. Now, when the coral faces some certain insults, it might have a bleaching response. And you probably have heard about this related to elevated water temperatures. So when, it gets, so when these corals get bathed in really warm water for a significant amount of time, that relationship between the coral and the algae breaks down and the coral actually expels all the algae from its tissue. So imagine if you, know, you had that, um, those leaves underneath your skin, that relationship breaks down and you pull it out and get rid of it. Now, you're no, these corals are no longer going to have their primary energy source, but they're still alive. So if they can make it through a few weeks and that insult goes away, they can start to reclaim that algae and then continue to grow happy and healthy as they did before. However, with the tissue loss disease that we're facing, we don't really have that middle ground, will they, won't they survive, um, like a bleached coral does. It goes straight to a tissue loss. You essentially see the disintegration of that coral tissue and the algae inside it just completely disappear and all you're left with is that bare skeleton underneath that can then get colonized by that turf algae that we saw in the previous picture. What that looks like when you're looking at the coral itself is you know that darker coloration is usually that live coral that is at this point unaffected. That bright white area is where you're seeing the active tissue loss, that's where the coral is dying and that very fresh skeleton is being exposed. And then that yellowish area all the way at the top is that exposed coral skeleton that's starting to get colonized by that turf algae. Now, as I mentioned, there are lots of different insults that are faced by coral reefs and coral reefs in Florida, but I kind of want to describe why this is perhaps an unprecedented one and really why it's become a villain in our conservation story. And it's due to five main factors. The first is that this is a persistent insult. With lots of things that happen to our coral reefs, they kind of, they come and they go, which gives the corals an opportunity to bounce back and recover. But what we're seeing with this is that the, the disease was first found in um, 2014, as I had mentioned, and it has continued to spread unabated since that time, both north and south throughout our reef tract. What's really interesting and pretty scary is that you can still go to the areas that were first affected by this disease in 2014 and find colonies with active tissue loss disease. So it's not just that it comes and then goes away, it sticks around to a point that we now are now considering it endemic, which means that it kind of lives in the system now. It's also a very broad insult. So in addition to affecting pretty much our entire contiguous reef tract that we have along Florida's coral reef, um, it is now also impacting 16 other areas or locations throughout the Caribbean. Fortunately, it is still contained within the Caribbean, and we don't really know if it can make it to the Pacific, but even just having it spread across the entirety of this ocean basin is a really broad and huge insult that we're seeing. As Beth had mentioned, this is also a very common insult in that it impacts a lot of our different coral species simultaneously. Um, this is pretty unique to diseases. Most often you have one disease impact one species. You can kind of think about it like you and your pets. When you catch a cold, you don't pass it along to your dog. And same when your dog has a flu, you don't catch that doggy flu. But in this case, what we're seeing is that about half of the species of the coral species that we have in Florida are being impacted by what appears to be the same disease. Um, and as Beth had mentioned, these are really, really, really important corals that we have here. These are the ones that are building that really large structure that is vital for habitat for fishes and invertebrates. Um, and that does a lot of work for, protect, for protecting our coasts from things like wave action and storm surge. It also happens to affect all of our really, uh, I think, charismatic species, like those brain corals and paler corals and flower corals, as well as all of our, uh, or most of our um, endangered species. 
So this is really common, but it's common amongst super, super important and already threatened corals. Um, it also tends to have a really high prevalence rate. So normally any population has disease. It is just a natural part of life. And normally along Florida's coral reef, you have under 3% um, of colonies being affected by disease kind of as your background level period. With this disease, we're seeing upwards of 66% prevalence rates um, amongst affected corals. So what that means is that anywhere from two thirds to all of the corals that can catch this disease will catch this disease. And the reason that those numbers are so scary is because this has a 100% mortality rate of affected corals. So if, this, if any coral catches this disease, more likely than not, it's gonna die unless we do something about it. And so that's why those prevalence rates and these mortality rates together um, are so significant and they really are impacting, especially the highly susceptible species to the point where we're seeing some of these species um, being you know, locally ex exterminated pretty much from um, our reefs. And so these factors all together um, have kind of culminated in something that is pretty unprecedented for us. And so a lot of our partners that work really closely on this do think that this is the most lethal coral disease that we've seen anywhere recorded, not just in Florida and not just in the Caribbean, but pretty much anywhere um, due to those factors. And because of this, because it's been so impactful and because this seems to be for many of our, our coral species, potentially what could be the final insult um, that is really why it is the villain of our story today. Hi, everyone. So a very, very powerful villain calls for a very, very powerful response force. So today I'll be sharing about how we are fighting the villain on all fronts. So here in Florida, we have what we like to call the disease avengers who are fighting stony coral tissue loss disease on all fronts. There are regular superhero meetings, if you will, to facilitate collaboration on a weekly basis. And it's also really important to us that we engage concerned citizens about coral conservation and the disease more broadly. So you can kind of think of us as the disease avengers. The Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease Response Team really has nine Avengers if you think about it. We have a team that focuses on communications and outreach, another that focuses on data management and visualizing data solutions, so creating products that we use both internally and share externally, a team that focuses on Caribbean cooperation, another that focuses on research and epidemiology, and even within that research team, there are multiple adventures who work on different facets of research. We also have a restoration team and a reconnaissance and intervention team that works on tracking the path of the disease and intervening when and where appropriate. We also have a coral rescue team that we'll be talking more about today and a coral propagation team that focuses on rearing the next generations of corals to outplant on Florida's coral reef as well as a regulatory team that focuses on helping us overcome different roadblocks that we might face with different permitting and regulation issues as we navigate the space. So in that communications network, it's really important to stay connected internally and externally. So the disease as a whole, uh, the disease response rather, is co-led by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, or FWC, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, NOAA, and the National Park Service. So those are also four of our key communicators, in addition to Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, Moat Marine Laboratory, Florida Sea Grant, which Maurizio works for, and AGRA in the Caribbean. But it's much more than just that. We've also got a partner communications network as well, and we're always sharing information with them back and forth. This includes the counties, universities, and other NGOs too. To communicate with the public, we're regularly updating what we call the Coral Disease Portal, and you can check it out at this website here. Here you can find more information on the latest and greatest research, really exciting news that the different teams have to share, different ways that you can get involved if you're in the Southeast Florida area by clicking the citizen participation button, uh, and different opportunities for media to check out photo and video as well. If you're looking for more technical information, you can check out the Florida DEP website. 
On this site, every single response team that I mentioned earlier has their own sub page so that you can learn more about their specific work and click on their different products and reports too. Our other partners also have websites too, so you can check out the FWC website to learn more about the disease. And speaking of really cool public facing products, this is one that our data management team created for the Coral Rescue Team. So if you check out this dashboard, which is updated regularly, you can see where all the rescued corals are currently living and what kinds we've rescued too. So with our researchers, it's also really important that they are keeping in touch too. Of course, there's no I in team, so we have a lot of different tools to keep researchers connected. And it's really great that we've cultivated this culture of sharing successes and failures regularly so that people aren't trying and failing at an experiment that someone else perhaps already tried and failed at. So sharing research is really important on the team, and we make sure that we're always uploading reports and things like that to the DEP website and notifying folks when we do so. We also have a reconnaissance network that includes both folks who are active in the disease response ever on a regular basis and can include citizen scientists. So as you can imagine, if there's a villain running around Gotham, we gotta let Batman know. So the recon team and the citizen scientists help alert the Avengers and let us know where the disease is. We also have a more streamlined approach to monitoring as well called the Florida Reef Resilience Program Disturbance Response Monitoring. So these surveys are done every summer along the entire reef and the different sites are divided among our many partners. So this is the intervention monitoring dashboard. So you can look where we're treating corals here on Florida's coral reef, what kinds of species and what treatments were applied. This is a really one to click through. And here's are some different examples of the treatments and trainings. So we're always working on a uh, creating new treatments for the disease. On the far left, you can see a diver applying an antibiotic paste to a coral that has a bright yellow tag at the bottom of it. Select corals uh, that are being treated down in the Florida Keys have these yellow tags and are photographed regularly to monitor their conditions. So if you're diving in South Florida and you ever see a disease tag, snap a photo, follow the directions, and boom, you can be a disease avenger too. We also have learning exchanges in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands to teach folks more about the different types of treatments that they can apply. As you can see, it's certainly all hands on deck for these Avengers. And that means that we need to consider all possible avenues for saving our special corals. And this even includes rescuing corals ahead of the disease line. So when coral rescue came to the table, we thought, well, if we wanna rescue all these corals, we need some place to put them. In other words, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Thankfully, the AZA has lots of boats, so to speak, or places where they can store corals. And they've got the knowledge of coral care as well. So it was really a match made in heaven. The goal with rescuing these healthy corals ahead of the disease line is preserving genetic diversity for ongoing and future restoration of Florida's coral reef. And it's been really exciting to see the rescue program and the AZA partnership uh, grow. And we've found how critical it is to have public private partnerships in the disease response effort. So who are those additional superheroes? Well, those superheroes, as Michelle uh, mentioned, are our Association of Zoos and Aquariums accredited members. The Association of Zoos and Aquariums joined the Florida Rescue in November of 2018 officially. This band of zoo and public aquarium heroes and heroines, a capable band, a very lovable band of aquarists, vets, and support teams from across the United States have become the latest group of superheroes who against all odds, including a, a disease pandemic are bringing hope to Florida's corals. So where are these superheroes located around the country? Well, you can see right here on the left is the list of our holding facilities. These are our foster parent facilities for our refugees as we call them. 
18 facilities currently in 12 different states with two facilities coming online from two additional states in the coming months. We also have 50 friends facilities across 26 states. These facilities, for whatever reason, can't hold Florida corals um, as part of the rescue program, but they said, hey, we wanna be a part of this. Like Chris Corpus from the Dallas Zoo and originally from the Aquarium Pacific, we, were, we're, we're, we have lots of manpower. We have lots of resources available to us through our institutions. And sometimes a project, a network this large, an adventure this big needs more than just the people holding the corals, but we need folks that can help drive the project, help do all of the things that a project of this size requires. So if we were to look at what a rescue effort like this entails, well, you can probably divide what is needed into three main categories. We have talent, time, and of course, treasure. So let's take a look at, at that. Talent. Coral aquarists, if you've ever met one, are a, read, a rare breed. Whether you're a home hobby, hobbyist or a professional coral aquarist, you're a special person. And within the public aquarium uh, profession, really good coral aquarists are even a rare breed. And in our AZA institutions, we're really fortunate to have nearly 100 staff, at least five per facility, that have been identified to manage the daily care and welfare of the corals in their care. That's curators, vets, vet techs, aquarists, lab techs, even the folks that manage the life support system are included in, in our team of superheroes. And realizing at the very beginning, well, let's just be honest, at the beginning, we thought that our limiting resource would be space. We had to find space for thousands of corals coming out of Florida. But we found that space. And what our real limiting factor is, is talent. There are only so many coral aquarists around our country to go around. So almost immediately, we started to develop a coral aquarist training program and 14 facilities are now working on that effort. It'll be a program that will build the bench, create the next generation of coral superheroes at our facilities. But all of this, the care, the planning, the outreach, it all takes time. And right now, just a few numbers to throw out from a, from a survey that we did earlier in 2020, our coral holding facilities are taking 200 hours a week in coral care. That's anything from uh, adjusting lights to doing water changes, to scrubbing algae, to removing detritus, to maintaining the maintenance animals, the hermit crabs and the snails and the urchins that help clean the tanks between Aquarius cleanings. We are also spending over 40 hours a week in feeding these corals. These corals are photosynthetic, yes, but they also derive a lot of nutrition from the environment they live in, using their tentacles to pull in microscopic uh, organisms that are floating by them in the water column. And being able to provide that additional nutrition is really important for healthy corals. The work that's being done at each facility is complemented and strengthened by the fact that each one of these facilities is part of a network, a support system. Uh, each week for one hour, all of our coral holding facilities meet online and have been meeting online for two years now, um, long before COVID came in and required every, uh, everybody to do a Zoom meeting once a week. Our Aquarists were meeting together, sharing their failures, sharing their successes, talking corals, making sure that the care is consistent across facility lines and making sure that we as colleagues for corals are growing with our experience and our knowledge. We also have a coral health management advisory group up, made up of veterinarians, field researchers and biologists, uh, scientists that are working on the on stony coral tissue loss disease out in the field, as well as veterinarians that are taking care of our corals. We're working together and learning even more about these corals because quite honestly, the majority of these corals have never been held in human care for a really super long period of time. 
We're also reaching out to our commercial partners, those companies that are providing the equipment necessary to maintain the systems that these corals are in. They're even jumping on board, providing resources and equipment at cost or below cost to support our holding facilities with this monumental investment in rescue. And of course, just like today, we're trying to tell people about the story of coral rescue. We're trying to make sure that we learn from this experience and we share why this experience was so necessary, why the rescue was mounted in the first place and what everyone can do to help our world's oceans. And of course, all of this costs treasure. In a recent slide that was provided to the Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease Technical Workshop earlier this year, Jennifer Moore from NOAA Fisheries provided this slide, which really hits home. Coral rescue is not a cheap date. Right now, between July 2018 and December of this year, it's estimated that over $14 million will be invested in coral rescue. And I'm proud to say that our AZA institutions have provided the majority of that funding. $9.1 million. What's even more important and more that speaks to the heart of the facilities that have jumped on that rocket, rocket ship and not asking where they sit, but just jumping on board is that 88% of the funding for what they've contributed so far to this rescue project has been derived from existing budgets and resources, moving people around a little left and right to make it work, making sure that their conservation budgets are supporting this effort. 88% of that was from their facilities and not from any government agency or outside, outside agency. So building our, building our bench, spending the time that is needed is really important and making sure that our facilities are, are taking good care and providing good welfare for our corals is really important. We're exceptionally proud of the work that our AZA facilities are doing that our partners are doing with us to bring hope to Florida's coral reef. So what's the moral to the story? What are the takeaways to the adventure? Well, I think Chris is gonna share that in his section. That's right. Thank you, Beth. And greetings, everyone. Thanks for having us here. It's nice to virtually be back at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Uh, I am Chris Corpus, as Sean introduced earlier. I work at the Dallas Zoo as the Conservation Programs Manager which may sound weird that a guy who works at a landlocked facility is involved in a coral rescue effort, uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that and why that matters. What I wanna start out with though, is talking a little bit about the hero's journey and how that kind of relates to the moral of our story and of this conservation effort. The hero's journey is a framework of storytelling that has been around um, for all of humanity's storytelling efforts. Uh, Joseph Campbell, was the one who identified it uh, earlier in the 1900s. But it's a technique that's been used in everything from classics like Homer's Odyssey to modern tales like Star Wars or even some of the goofier ones like Emily in Paris on Netflix. All of these stories involve a hero's journey. And the heroes that you've heard about today, the scientists, the researchers, the conservationists are all dedicated towards traveling through this journey to a successful end of rescuing and saving these coral, uh, coral reefs. In a hero's journey, you identify a problem and build some desire to attack that problem. And that's when you start out on your adventure, on that journey. And through that journey, you overcome so many different issues. You're gonna come across surprises and problems and difficulties, smaller villains that lead to the big villain in the end. And of course, we've been experiencing all of that, or the scientists have been experiencing all of that in their work studying these coral reefs and studying the disease as it uh, attacks the reefs. But as we're going through all those difficulties, as we're going through all those struggles, we're also learning lessons along the way. And that's the key part of the hero's journey is that you learn some lesson, learn something new about yourself, about your place in the world, about how the world works around you, and then take that new information to the climactic moment where you face the villain and overcome the situation. And we definitely, have been learning lots of lessons in this conservation effort. One of the lessons is that it takes all kinds. Uh, you saw the many different names of organizations and institutions that are supporting this conservation effort. I, again, am in a landlocked facility in the middle of Dallas, uh, which is why I had to throw some lion cub pictures up because they're super cute and they were born recently. 
they don't necessarily have anything to do with a coral reef effort, but the work of a conservation institution reaches beyond just a landlocked area. The ocean affects all of us. And we recognize that amongst all of these different AZA institutions who are working to support the work in Florida and again, try and end this disease uh, that we're facing. It starts with good science. That's what we've seen from people like Maurizio with that really good science and them being given the time to work on that good science to give us some of that new information. Remembering again, that that new information is how we're gonna face the issues. But good science also needs good collaboration. Again, all those different people that we saw. And in those different uh, collaborations, we need some diversity in there. We need to have an inclusive community of different voices, different strengths, different skills that come together to um, succeed in the conservation effort. Historically, uh, many conservation efforts have not done that and they have failed in some ways. And so we recognize that in this conservation effort, inclusiveness has been crucial to it and collaboration has been crucial to it. And it's a lesson that we are continuing to build off of and hopefully sharing with other conservation efforts uh, around the world. Another aspect that we recognize in a large scale conservation effort like this is that there, you also have to recognize conservation as a social science. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, once said that conservation of nature and conservation of people frequently go hand in hand. And it's so true. We can't save nature if we're not considering the people that are connected to nature. You saw those images from Maurizio of that all the people that live along the coast who are directly connected to um, the coral reefs out there. We experienced that same thing in Long Beach with the mass uh, amount of people that live in uh, Los Angeles and Orange County, all so close to an ocean ecosystem. And then me now being far away in Dallas and in the Midwest and in the center of the country, we're also very closely connected to the ocean through the weather patterns, through the rivers that lead to the ocean. All of the things that we do still impact the ocean down the line. And that becomes a really important part of storytelling and building empathy. One of the issues that we face is how do we get people to care about the corals in the same way that they might care about an animal like a giraffe. We see giraffes on t-shirts, on uh, toys, on television shows, they're on baby clothing, they're all over the place. People love giraffes, people feel connected to them, they support that conservation effort. We need to find ways to continue to connect people and build that empathetic connection, that understanding, that personal relationship with coral reefs and people. I mean, half the time, people don't even realize that coral is an animal, right? There's so much for us to really try and engage with people on to get them to build that relationship. And that's a huge part of the struggle that we try to accomplish or try to overcome. And a huge part of collaborating with diverse skill sets like Michelle's and like mine coming from a film and television background, uh, Beth pulled me in into the messaging group to start rethinking some ways that we can approach the AZA community and build more support in the AZA community for building out some of these coral holding facilities. And I think we've been pretty successful at that when you saw all the names and numbers in Beth's slides. This is a really, I'm gonna steal some of the previous slides here. This is a really difficult issue that we're facing. It's a devastating disease without question, right? It can ruin the economy, not just in Florida, but throughout uh, large parts of uh, North America, we would feel the effects of this disease if we don't somehow stop it. There's uh, food sources for us here in the United States and for people all across the Caribbean um, that would be affected by this disease and that are affected by this disease. It's a deadly villain with 100% mortality in some corals. That is daunting to think about trying to defeat and trying to overcome. Um, but there really is a lot of hope in that. And the hero's journey, it's key to have hope. There's no point in taking a journey and there's no point in trying to do anything if you have no hope. But there really is hope. Even against a villain like this, there's a lot of hope with the people that are involved, the collaboration that is so key. You see all these different organizations here. You see more organizations here and you see even more here. And within those organizations are hundreds of people, hundreds of individuals who really care and have that empathetic connection for those coral reefs and for our oceans. And for us, continuing to try and build that is paramount. Continuing to try and connect more people to this uh, here on the West Coast now 
trying to educate everyone on the West Coast about the issues that we're facing on the East Coast. We do have one ocean. Thankfully, right now, the disease hasn't spread across the entire ocean, but there's nothing to say that diseases can't continue to travel and be moved and, and taken different places. So it's imperative that more people know about it and more people try and support uh, in that time, that energy and that treasure, like Beth mentioned. We have hope. We have lots of people involved in this. We have a great success story in the connection that has been built through people already. And we know that we can continue to work on it, but we'll need more people's help. And that's why we're thankful to be speaking with all of you today. I'll turn it back to you now, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This was a fascinating, albeit somewhat um, terrifying story that you were, were sharing with us. Um, I do have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask our, our panelists um, from a few things that piqued my interest throughout our talk. Uh, the first question, and I'm not sure who to direct this to, is if we could learn a little bit more about the epidemiology of this particular disease. I don't think that we heard anyone refer to this as being a bacterial or a fungal or a parasitic infection, but I'm curious to know if we know exactly what this disease actually is. So can somebody speak to that a, a little bit? I think I can take that one. Um, that is one of the biggest questions that we are faced with. Um, what it comes down to is we don't know for sure. Um, there are several kind of competing hypotheses that we are actively researching, trying to figure out. But one of the things that I want to highlight before I say that is that it is uh, immensely difficult to figure out. Um, you know, first of all, anything that happens in the ocean becomes twice as difficult because you have to deal with being out in the ocean. And then corals themselves, um, we don't know a ton about. Uh, you can imagine if we use kind of the human disease outbreak that we're all faced with right now, um, just how much time and money and people are going into learning about coronavirus in a system, the human body, that we already know an absolute ton about. Comparatively, our thinking about kind of coral disease knowledge, it's like we're almost back in the dark ages. So we're learning so much about the corals themselves as we're trying to figure out this big new problem. Um, one of the things that I you know, mentioned earlier where you usually have one disease for one um, species, another issue that we have with corals, um, well, to take a step back, usually in, in you know, normal epidemiology, you have one bacterium or virus that leads to one disease. But in the case of corals, we have actually seen that it's sometimes multiple pathogens working together to manifest as a single disease. And so even our traditional thought of, well, we can identify one bacterium that will lead to one disease might not actually be true for corals. So that's kind of a long way of saying we don't know. Um, as Michelle had mentioned, we do um, see success in the application of antibiotics to stop this disease, which does suggest that bacteria do play a role. That said, the bacterial infec infections could be secondary. So something like an autoimmune disease in humans like HIV or AIDS, oftentimes that's not what kills you know, the, the patients, it's a secondary infection like pneumonia. So that could be a situation that we're seeing with this coral as well, where there's some initiating infection and it's just that secondary bacterial infection that we're treating. There's also a whole host of other things that can be going on, like it could be a physiological response to something like a toxin or a heavy metal or something else that's moving through the system that almost like one coral will cue to another that it should start like sloughing off tissue as a defense mechanism that just kind of rolls into a, a situation that the coral itself can't stop. So long story short, we don't know. Um, it does appear to be a kind of transmissible disease. If you can remember the, the map, seeing it move through the Florida reef tract where it started from an epicenter and you saw it move through the population in a way that appears to be infectious. So um, we do think it's a disease, but really what's causing it, we don't know. Got it. I, that's, that is a very difficult challenge to overcome for sure. Um, and Beth had mentioned earlier on that um, there were 45 species of corals that inhabit the, uh, this Florida reef system and that around 20, 22 species are impacted. The first image that comes to my mind when I think about Caribbean coral species are the gigantic branching corals, elkhorns and staghorn corals. Are those two species susceptible to this disease as well? 
Marita, you want to catch this one or you want me to, to grab my mitt and catch this one? I, no, I'm, I'm happy to. Go for it. Go for <laughs> so it. Very fortunately, um, those two coral species, our staghorn and elkhorn coral, um, are not susceptible to this disease. We have done, you know, so, and this comes both from um, observations out in the field. So you can go to some of those really big fields of, say, that staghorn coral. None of them are being affected by this. And then we did some challenge experiments in the lab where we tried to expose these um, these branching corals to the disease, and fortunately, they did not appear to be susceptible to it, nor did they appear to be a vector of it, which means, um, for folks who maybe don't know, these are two species that we use most in coral restoration in, in the Caribbean, including Florida. And so we were almost nervous that if we, say, uh, grow a coral in some area on our map that's red and move it to an area that's green, we might be moving that disease. And so we, we did some experiments to try to confirm as much as possible that that's not the situation. And so we feel very thankful that both they are not susceptible to this disease and they don't appear to be able to kind of move it if we tend to move those species around the reef tract. Thank you, Maurizio. I'm curious also about the um, corals that are being collected and housed in AZA facilities. Um, and um, Michelle mentioned collecting these corals ahead of the infection as it's moving along. But I'm curious to know if there have been any incidents of this disease manifesting in any captive collections, um, maybe from the corals that had been collected prophylactically, or if we've seen this imp impacting any of the current collections of, of coral uh, reef systems and AZA facilities. To be honest with you, no, um, at this point. Um, and again, hearkening back to what Mauricio said, we're still learning the process this, this, that this disease takes. We do know that it, it, it manifests first in the gastrodermis, which is the gut of the, pol uh, of the, of the coral polyp. Um, so being able to see that a coral is actually sick um, it's not something that's self-evident very, very quickly. It's something that has to take time, but we are fairly confident um, knowing what we know now about stony coral tissue loss disease, where our corals that were rescued were collected from, that those corals do not have the disease from what we know now. Got it, thank you. Uh, just a couple more questions too. Um, Near the end of our discussion, there was a little mention of the, of the global pandemic that's impacting all of us. Um, I'm interested to know specifically how this, this recent pandemic has been impacting the work that you all have been doing on this project in Florida and throughout the AZA institutions. Well, I do know from, from being a part of the coral rescue team that um, even during the pandemic, um, crews, the rescue team was going out and um, doing collections, but they were incredibly, <laughs> very, very safe, you know, social distancing as much as a scientific field expedition can, wearing masks and, and that sort of thing, and, and really following the guidelines established by the state of Florida. At our institutions, um, it, it's a, the corals, corals don't stop needing something when your staff gets sick or your facility shuts down. So um, our facilities have been continuing to care even when they've been closed and managing their corals. Um, it has been very, very tough for our, our institutions across the country because a lot of the money that, uh, that is generated from gate proceeds supports our conservation projects. When those gates aren't open, conservation projects sort of dwindle, right? And so we've been very, very lucky that um, our facilities have made this project a priority and have to a facility continued their commitment even through this and are even really excited about what the future holds with propagation and then taking the little baby corals back to the reef to restore it. Um, so they're still there, still caring and closed. Um, and probably the best thing that folks around the country can do to support this effort, especially if you're in Colorado, um, you know, where you're not even close to the Florida reef, um, is visit your local AZA institutions, show their support. When it's safe and you feel comfortable, 
of course, social distance, wear the masks, do what you need to keep your family safe. But that's the best thing to do right now for our AZA institutions that are supporting this project is to support them. Um, they do need that support. So um, that's, that's the easiest thing to do to, to support Coral Rescue right now. Thank you, Beth. And you jumped the gun on my final question that oh, I I'm sorry. To all the analysts. No, it's a perfect segue. And I wonder if anybody else has anything to offer to, to share some ideas about how, for instance, someone in California or someone in California can help to support this project. Going to AZA, visiting AZA institutions, I think is, is ideal um, for sure. Um, <laughs> speaking a little selfishly in that regard, mm -hmm. um, but are there some other methods that some of us can do if we, if we don't live close to these, to, this, to the epicenter of where this problem is occurring? Sure, I can add on to that, Sean. So I'd say the biggest thing is just having these conversations with people in your home and your close friends, um, just about Florida's coral reef more broadly. Uh, many people, when they think about coral here in Florida, they often think of the Florida Keys. But as Maurizio showed that map, you saw the disease spread north first before it spread south. North where many people don't even think we have corals to begin with. So just having a conversation about coral reefs in America is a great first step. And of course, we have coral reefs elsewhere too, right? In Hawaii and the other uh, jurisdictions like Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, having a conversation about coral more broadly and how you can be a coral champion with more broad ocean conservation measures at home uh, is a really great first step. And just being aware of stony coral tissue loss disease. Excellent. Thank you so very much. I'd like to offer our panelists any final thoughts if they'd like to share before we conclude our program for this evening. Yeah, I wanted to tag on one more thing uh, to Michelle and Beth on that. You know, with the reef that Maurizio is working in and, and all the other scientists are working in, it's a big reef, as Michelle said, and it's a very important one. And when you think about other big reefs in the world, probably the, the one that most people think of is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And that sense of pride and ownership that all people of Australia have for that Great Barrier Reef. And when we have an equivalent, maybe not exact in size, but equivalent in value reef here in, in the United States and in North America, um, it's one that I would love to see people recognize the importance of it to our entire country and to be able to own it as part of uh, our North American reef uh, that we can really take some pride in and share about and um, glory in in the same way that people in Australia do for the Great Barrier Reef. It's a super valuable area that I think anybody, whether you're in Minnesota, Texas, California, or Florida can all see value in. It's a national treasure. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a really good takeaway for, for this program. Show your reef some love. That's a, a, a new bumper stickers across the land. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you so much, Sean. My, it's been my pleasure for sure. Thank you, panelists. And thank you everyone who are watching from home um, and joining us for this webcast. Uh, the video presentation that we've just um, presented will be archived at the aquarium's website, aquariumofpacific.org and it will also be archived on the Aquarium's YouTube page. Be sure to check out our other virtual guest speaker events coming up, including our um, Exploring Sustainable Seafood series, which is releasing new episodes weekly, and our upcoming Aquatic Academy course that will be focusing on the impacts of COVID-19 on our society. Uh, you can find more information about both of these program offerings at the aquariumofpacific.org uh, website. Thank you so very much. It's been my pleasure to be your host for this evening. And I hope you enjoy your night. Thank you.